This is a story I don't want to have to tell, and in modern Australia, I shouldn't need to tell. It's about decent people in the country who are dying because of a rural health system that's letting them down. They're people like my precious dad. For many years, Brian Ryan was a farmer who lived near Taree, north of Newcastle in New South Wales. He died a year ago, but I believe my 88-year-old dad would still be here today if not for a serious medical error that occurred while he was being treated in the local health system. What happened to my dad, Brian Ryan, is inexcusable, but it's just one of many cases that are as heartbreaking as they are tragic. My dad was always indestructible, always the rock. He may have accepted he'd die one day, but the day he died, I didn't. I instinctively knew that what I was witnessing was wrong because he didn't have to die that day. I couldn't look away. I couldn't walk away. I couldn't pretend it hadn't happened. I couldn't pretend it was somebody else's dad. I couldn't pretend that this was somebody else's story. This was brutal and it was awful. Dad always stood up for me. Now I'm standing up for him. What he would want me to do is to not take a step back, particularly on this front. My dad would always fight for the underdog. He always cared about others and he always cared about justice. He always did. And I can't let him down. Sharing this story with me, this journey in many ways, is ABC journalist Jamel Wells. It is a very country town. It's little. Everyone knows everyone here. Yeah. We are two daughters of two dads we loved. Two dads we lost to a health system that appears to be broken. He loved the country, he loved the bush, he was a real bushman. We're in Jamel's town, her dad's town, Cobar in outback New South Wales. Dad loved Cobar. Whenever Dad would call me, he would ring and leave a message on my answering machine and he'd say, Jamel, it's Dad ringing from Cobar. <laughs> he loved the town right up until he died, but the best the town could do for him was to kick him out of the hospital to a nursing home. And I think that was the turning point for my father. He just lost, he lost everything then. Uh, Jamal, what did the judge say in handing down this sentence? Like me, Jamal is a country girl who went to the city for her career. Guilty of the murder of her daughter, She never thought she'd be back trying to find out what went fatally wrong for her dad in a country hospital. Nor did I think I'd be going home to New South Wales Manning River, asking the same questions about my father's death. He trusted and he absolutely believed everybody would do the right thing. This was always going to be the hardest story I'd ever tell. My dad was Brian Ryan. He died at Manning Base Hospital on September the 11th last year as a result of a catastrophic stroke. The medication prescribed to prevent that stroke was not given to him for eight days. I grew up in Taree, three hours north of Sydney. It's dairy country, and this was Dad's old farm. My dad was there for all those pivotal moments in my life when I thought my ball was crashing. He didn't. He would tell me it's not. He would never do anything other than put his arms around me and tell me it's okay. It's this unconditional sort of mm. love. No matter what you did, they were proud of you. And oh, even, even when I wasn't proud of me, he was. <laughs> <laughs> My mum, Patricia and Dad raised five kids, four boys and me. 
They'd been married for more than 65 years when Mum passed away in 2018. It was not an easy time for Dad, but he was determined to get on with life. Then, late last year, at 88, he developed pneumonia, from which he was recovering well. I think Dad just felt good and felt strong and felt capable. He had pneumonia and he overcame it and I could see again in his eyes, I'm back <laughs> and I'm going to be OK. Jamel's dad was Alan Wells, a builder from Cobar, the small but famous copper mining town in outback New South Wales. Dad was a good man. He had very simple tastes in life, but he was proud and very stoic and he was a family man. And how did he view his health and you know, his mortality, I guess? I don't think he thought about it. I think he thought he would live forever and he had the will to live forever. He wanted to keep going forever and I think he thought that would be the case. Dad was a carpenter, he was a builder, he built his own home. Yeah. Alan Wells was a dedicated community volunteer. He was president of Cobar Lions Club, which helped build the town's parks and gardens and regularly raised funds for Cobar Hospital. I'll give you a daisy, a day, dear. In 2016, after a lifetime together, Alan's beloved wife Cecilia died. After being married for almost 60 years, he was lost without her. He loved her so much. He would go out to the Cobar Cemetery twice a day to take flowers from his garden to her. And sometimes the fellow who looks after the cemetery would say, why have you come back? And he'd say, well, a new rose has just opened. So she would want to have this. He loved her. His heart was with Mum and no one else. In the country, I think it is accepted that the medical services aren't like the city, but it is also um, trusted that there would be great um, care, dignity um, and as many resources as could possibly be found in the country. My mum and dad expected that they would be cared for in a very professional and a good way. For an 88-year-old, dad was in reasonable shape. He had a heart condition, atrial fibrillation, and his one essential medication was a blood thinner specifically prescribed to prevent strokes. On the 22nd of August last year, Dad was admitted to the emergency department of Menning Base Hospital suffering pneumonia. That night, a series of medication errors saw Dad's heart rate dip to dangerously low levels. It was a near miss, but he recovered and fought off his chest infection, then continued his recuperation in Tari's private hospital, the Mayo. It was there where another dreadful error was made. We'd seen Dad that afternoon and um, I knew he wasn't at his best. He was very keen to come home, but he wasn't at his best. I could see he was tired and so I said, we'll see you tomorrow, Dad, and we left. And uh, we went home and had dinner and um, the call came to say, you know, I'm sorry your dad's had a serious stroke and we've transferred him back to the public hospital for treatment. I got there and I was told instantly Dad had suffered a catastrophic stroke and um, to be honest I went through all that awfulness of oh god I didn't think it would happen like this you know he was so well and um, but I accepted that this can happen you know and uh, he's 88 and I guess he can have a stroke. At two in the morning, Dad was wheeled into an empty room in a ward on the top floor. Other than his family, no one came to see him or us. We were standing there thinking, well, you know, something must happen now. You know, you just don't park a patient and don't tell somebody. And we were there for, 
oh, a good 15, 20 minutes and his notes were just plonked on the end of the bed and that's when I started to look at the notes and that's when I saw, you know, the, the terrible truth. Dad's medical notes stated that the doctor from the Mayo Private Hospital came to the emergency department to advise that Dad hadn't been given the critical medication, a Pixaban, he took to help prevent strokes for more than a week. If that hadn't happened to Dad, I feel confident that he wouldn't have suffered that stroke. I feel confident that he could still be here. I couldn't believe it. Something like that, so simple, could go wrong. I think I knew, I, I think I knew I had to do something. This is my dad. We were to take him home today, but we're not. Because of what's been called an error. Dad is now dying because of some terrible mistakes that were made with his medication. I still can't look at that. I, I don't even know who I was talking to. I instinctively wanted to say something. Um, I think, I think I couldn't believe it. I think recording it almost made me realise it was real. I think I was recording my hurt, my horror, my sadness. And my dad. Coming up. One of the nurses came in and said, you can't stay here. Unwanted. My father's begging for food and water. Can't you help him? And she said, no. The hospitals where cruelty. To hear those words must be so painful. Not care. In a hospital, who does that? Is the likely treatment. No one deserves that. It's just heartbreaking. That's next on 60 Minutes. Like me, journalist Jamel Wells recently suffered the anguish of losing her 85-year-old father, Alan. In Taree, I discovered in medical notes on my dad's hospital bed that his vital anti-stroke medication had not been given to him during his entire eight days in the local private hospital. Equally harrowing for Jamel was witnessing the treatment her late father received in Dubbo's public hospital after surgery for a fractured hip. When he passed away, is that when you decided to try and join some dots? Yes. Separately and now together, we started asking questions. One night in the hospital, we were sitting with Dad, uh, talking to him, and he just looked at me and he said, Love, I've got a feeling they've done the wrong thing by me. Something's gone wrong. Jamel's dad had fallen at home. The surgery to repair his broken hip at Dubbo Base Hospital seemed problematic from the start. There was infection and other complications, but Jamel and her father were kept in the dark. We knew something had gone wrong with the surgery. There was unexplained bleeding and he needed blood transfusions. And five days after that first surgery, they did a second surgery, which was a lot for an 85-year-old man. Two invasive surgeries within a week, but still no clear explanation as to what the issue was. Yet, after the second surgery, Dubbo Hospital wanted to discharge Jamil's father 
the very next day. We fought that discharge and within uh, a few hours of them letting him stay, he had the cardiac arrest and needed to be resuscitated and intubated. From the start, there was this presumption against resuscitating him. The doctors said to us, look, he's 85, you know, and we felt that we were fighting tooth and nail for him to be allowed to be treated, to allowed to live. Jamel refused to leave her father's side, now becoming increasingly concerned about his hospital treatment. Disturbingly, she says, her dad was refused food and drink for three days because she was told there was no one available to conduct a SIP test to ensure her father could swallow. I said, my father's begging for food and water, can't you help him? And she said, um, no. She said, we can't afford to roster anyone on a long weekend, you'll have to wait till Tuesday. That's harrowing. You have your father begging for food and water and he can't have any because somebody who can help him with that isn't rostered on until after the weekend. Who does that? In a hospital, who does that? Not long after, and despite still being very ill, Dubbo Hospital suddenly decided Alan Wells had to be sent back to Cobar. This chain of events then unfolded. It was very quick, it was very sudden. To Jamel, this urgency made no sense. My father was, in summer, 40 degree heat, taken out of Dubbo Base Hospital on an ambulance stretcher, being pushed into the ambulance, and I'm sort of following, going, well, can't we wait, can't we? No, no, you have to go, that's what's been arranged. The ambulance, with a fragile Alan Wells on board, began the long four-hour trip. I drove behind him for the whole trip. I didn't know what to do. I thought, this shouldn't be happening. He shouldn't be going back to Cobar. And when we pulled up at Cobar Hospital, it was at night. They pulled the trolley out of the ambulance and Dad said, I could see you following me the whole way. He'd seen me out through the ambulance doors following him. But after a week in Cobar Hospital, and despite there being spare beds, Jamel would hear for the second time that a hospital no longer wanted her father. One of the nurses came in and said, well, you can't stay here, you have to go to the nursing home. And at that point, my father's spirit was broken. He, you could see his eyes just were fearful. And he said, they're giving up on me. They're giving up on me. And to hear those words must be so painful. When they wheeled him out of Cobo Hospital, he was crying. There were tears running down his cheeks. And to see a proud man who'd done volunteer work for the hospital in his youth, who'd put so much into the town, who loved the town, be wheeled off to a nursing home, it was just heartbreaking. On November the 10th last year, Five days after being sent to a nursing home, Alan Wells died. From the moment I spoke to Jamel, I knew that she was a kindred spirit. We spoke a language I think that only those who've been through what we've been through spoke. I understood her passion, her drive, her determination, her anger, and her overwhelming push to make something happen, because that's exactly how I felt. We all have to die sometime. We all get old, some people die young. But to be robbed of your dignity, to have your spirit broken by medical professionals who don't want to keep treating you, who want to discharge you, who make assumptions that, well, you're 85 and you're going to die. No one deserves that. No one deserves that, especially such an honest and trusting man that my father was. It has changed me and it has made me want to get to the bottom of, of what went wrong with his care. Coming up. We didn't fight hard enough. We were too nice. The medical records mixer. 
this was a man from Narromine, not Alan Wells from Cobar. One more embarrassing bungle. This poor old fellow's information had been sold to us. As a hospital boss. Do you have anything to say about the criticisms of the hospital? Takes offence. We don't want you filming on the property. It's a hospital. It should be about caring. That's next on 60 Minutes. There were very basic things wrong on the records. Jamel Wells and I are investigating the deaths of our fathers. It's very hard to read medical records about your loved one who has died. But for both of us, it started as a very private quest. You're experiencing a very personal trauma and you're trying to walk through this pool of grief, but there's a journalist always inside you going, this is just wrong. This, this is just wrong. This is where Dad's life really took a terrible turn. The Mayo Private Hospital in Taree. It's here where he failed to receive his vital anti-stroke medication for his entire eight-day stay. Of all the medications not to give him, that was the most important medication for him to have. Under no illusion as to our family's disbelief and anger, the Mayo Hospital conducted an investigation. It admitted the almost unforgivable error that upon admission, a doctor simply failed to properly chart Dad's medication. But I also discovered this was a 79-bed hospital with just one doctor at a time on a temporary rotating basis. And on the night of Dad's stroke, the doctor on duty wasn't actually in the hospital, but on call. At Manning Public Hospital, where Dad was later taken, the stark reality of rural health was beginning to take shape when medical staff revealed their own painful stories. Dad was still in his hospital bed when nurses spoke to us and said, we're really sorry about what happened to your dad. One nurse actually said to me, I'm a nurse because that's what happened to my dad. It also occurred to me that if I hadn't seen those notes, would I be telling this story? Would I ever know? Would anyone have ever told us? Um, I don't know. We're at Dubbo Base Hospital. This is the place where you feel everything went wrong. Yeah. And it's here where Jamil Wells' father, Alan, underwent two operations within a week before being hastily moved on. Is there an issue? Oh, yeah, because he's not supposed to be filming on the... Oh, okay. yeah. Out of the blue appears the hospital's general manager, Debbie Bickerton. Is there a particular concern? I oh, know, just that we don't want you filming on the property, that's all. The general manager is much less concerned with discussing complaints with us about patient care. Um, do you have anything to say about the criticisms of the hospital? Nothing. Nothing? No. Not concerned about anything that's been said? Miss Bickerton's priorities offered little comfort to Jamel. It's a hospital, it should be about caring. I still can't, can't understand why you have to fight so hard in a system to look after an elderly parent. I still can't understand that. The details Jamel has uncovered about her dad's treatment at times beggars belief. It made her want to search even deeper into his hospital care. I can see why she wanted to do a story because not to have told this story would have been terrible. It was almost like saying to the people that had done the wrong thing, it's okay. Alan Wells' health went into a sharp and inexplicable decline after two operations here at Dubbo Hospital. Jamel's mission to find out exactly why hasn't been made easy, starting with the outrageous cost she was charged for her dad's medical records. Dad died just before Christmas and I applied to Dubbo Hospital for his medical records. 
thinking that they would charge me the standard fee, which is around $33. So they rang me and said um, the cost will be over $600. Did they say why? <laughs> they didn't say why. I queried it and they said that's the fee for your father's medical records. So because it was all very raw, my father had just died, there were so many unanswered things about his care and his surgeries, I just put the money on my credit card because I thought, I, I need to know what happened. The medical records were a shambles. She found multiple pages missing. Doctors she'd never heard of listed as treating her father. And in a serious breach of patient confidentiality... It's not dead. The paperwork included another patient's records. So this was a man from Narromine, which is out west, but not Alan Wells from Coba. And this poor old fellow's information had been sold to us. But there was more. The records falsely stated Alan Wells had dementia and given as a reason why he was unable to request pain relief. There was also evidence of unexplained bruising. One of the nurses wrote in his records after his first surgery that his whole body was covered in bruising and right through his records, nurses write bruising, 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 but no doctor ever explored why that might have happened or offered any treatment. But the records failed to answer what went wrong with Alan Wells' first hip surgery and what the doctors found when he was operated on again five days later. You were searching for answers. Did you find any answers regarding your father's surgeries? No. <laughs> After the first surgery, my father had a massive bleed that required two blood transfusions. So the doctors told us that that's why they needed to do the second surgery. But after the second surgery, there is nothing in the records about a doctor reviewing him or, or what they found. And it's after that second surgery that my father became very, very unwell and deteriorated rapidly. When Dubbo Hospital decided Alan Wells should be discharged, he was pushed into an ambulance on a searing summer's day and driven to Cobar. That was when he was discharged from Dubbo Hospital and they didn't want him back. In his medical records, a note that Alan Wells was not to come back. Not for transfer back to Dubbo Base. So after reading his medical records, if you had your time again, you would do things very differently. Yeah. Yeah. We thought we fought tooth and nail for our father in hospital. We didn't fight hard enough. We were too nice, we were too polite. Coming up. You feel like you don't count because we're not listened to. Too afraid to talk. The more you jump up and down, the more you shun. How good doctors are silenced. Were you threatened with your job? Yes. And can it get any worse? The nurses kept saying to me, you should be on antibiotics. The blister that led to an amputation. That literally took my breath away. That's next on 60 Minutes. In our quest to learn more about what happened to our fathers, Jamel Wells and I began peeling back the layers of the healthcare system in our respective rural areas. And what we were discovering was alarming. It was only a matter of days before people were coming and saying, I understand what's happened to you and I know how you feel because something like that has happened to me. My upbringing in the valleys and beaches in the Manning River district of New South Wales was in many ways idyllic. But this is also home to the oldest demographic in New South Wales with the worst cardiac outcomes in regional Australia and a health service that struggles to cope. Morale of the staff working at Manning Hospital is terrible. Staff work in conditions with no infrastructure and no support. Medical professionals, including doctors and nurses, contacted me, 
but all were fearful of the consequences if they were identified. Anyone who speaks out is always under threat of not having their contracts renewed. Dr Gupta, the whistleblowers uh, operate in a, in a climate of fear, they tell me. Dr Krishna Gupta, chairman of the Manning Hospital Medical Staff Council, was dismayed that whistleblowers in his region, some probably colleagues, aren't given more protection. They are, they are the people who keep us honest and keep us on guard. They point out our deficiency and we need to work on that. So if that's the case, that's very unfortunate. Were you literally threatened with your job? Uh, that was said, yes. Speaking carefully, even from the relative security of his recent retirement, long-time specialist at Manning Base Hospital, Dr Philip Walkham, confirmed the climate of fear in the local health system. How did that impact uh, medical staff? Well, I think, you know, you go with the flow. And in essence, you know, if you start rocking the boat, particularly when you're out, in a place like this, you know, you don't want to lose your job or, or get a bad name for creating problems. The more you jump up and down, the more you're shunned. It's, uh, and who's doing the shunning? Uh, the people who provide the money. And who are they? The Hunter New England Health. Hunter New England Health runs Manning Base Hospital, the source of many terrible stories that were told to me. Perhaps the most confronting involved allegations that a young quadriplegic patient, who, as he lay in his bed, was physically assaulted and threatened by a hospital security worker. Patient disclosed that a man came in and threatened and physically assaulted him. It makes me lose faith in the whole system. That sort of thing shouldn't even happen in an ordinary situation, let alone in a hospital. It's just horrifying. His mother, Kerry, knows her once surfing champion son struggled with his disability and says he suffered complex mental health issues that made him a very difficult and challenging patient. Pressed his elbow into his neck. But she says threats of any kind are totally unacceptable. I'm just trying to picture, you know, him lying in bed and this great big security guard you know, putting pressure on his neck. He wouldn't be able to do anything, you know, it's just awful. Um, he's got no way of retaliating whatsoever. So it's just, just horrible. The security guard who assaulted the quadriplegic patient is the partner of Manning Hospital's general manager, Jody Nias. Ms Nias confirmed that the incident had been investigated, but said she'd declared a conflict of interest. The investigation resulted in the security guard being sacked. This is a young man who has found himself in a body that doesn't work. He was frightened. He was intimidated. He stopped eating and drinking. That literally took my breath away. A number of medical professionals told me they lacked confidence in Ms Nias's administration, but she maintained during a long meeting with me that she is the right person to be in charge of the hospital. The staff, everybody, knows there are issues simmering that are never being addressed. The general manager of the Manning Hospital told me that she could run the hospital with her eyes closed. I don't think anyone could run a hospital with their eyes closed, and I think that's probably a lack of perception of really what it takes. If there was one thing that you would change, if you could, to improve rural health, and particularly in this area, what might that be? <sighs> that's a very hard question. I really... I wouldn't know where to start. I really wouldn't. There's an arrogance in bureaucracy and government that we don't count and age, our ageing population, which we are the majority here, are just being dismissed. Long-time local resident and author Di Morrissey runs and funds a fiercely independent local newspaper with her husband, Boris. That's a lot of correspondence. That's about a whole four years' worth. But, but you can't receive 
some of these letters and not think, what can you do? You know, she and her paper have become a magnet for anyway, hospital whistleblowers, patients and their relatives who write to her because no one else, it seems, will pay attention to their stories. It's heartbreaking, it really is. And then you think, oh golly, this could be my mum, this could be my dad, this could be, you know, us. Di believes many people in the Manning feel dispirited, that their health needs are not a priority to those in charge. You feel like you don't count because we're not listened to and no, nothing changes. And money goes to things that don't seem appropriate when the real basics should be lo looked after. Have you got a health plan? I, my health plan? I said to a doctor friend, what do you do when you get sick? What are you going to do? And he said, get in a car and drive to Sydney. And I went, oh, righto. And it was like you were in a third world country. It was like the stuff we see on telly about Syria and, or Lebanon or, you know, Iraq. And, and there was just bedlam. And, you know, I've got to say it, there was people dying in there. Former miner John Stingemore is another casualty of Australia's rural health system. What he suffered as a patient in Cobar and Dubbo hospitals, where Jamel's dad also spent his final days, is so shocking, it's almost unbelievable. I went to the hospital and the charge nurse looked at me and she said, yes, that's serious. Last December, John walked into Cobar Hospital with an infected blister on his little toe. So began a nightmarish series of events. Bounced between Cobar and Dubbo hospitals, a round trip of eight hours, he worried his toe would deteriorate over the Christmas period when he wouldn't be able to see his GP for nearly two weeks. All those GPs were going on their holidays at 12 noon on the 20th of December and not coming back till the 6th of January. And he said, oh, it looks like it's going all right. How about we just sort of leave it at that and if it gets bad again, go to the hospital. When John finally got to see a doctor at Cobar Hospital, he was told his infection was so serious, his toe was now beyond repair. And he said, how do you feel about going to Dubbo for probably an amputation? And I said, well, mate, if I had a pair of bolt cutters, I'd just take it off myself, but I don't think I could sew it up. And he said, well, you, you can drive to Dubbo. And I said, whoa. I said, oh, look at my foot. I can't drive to Dubbo with that foot. John spent three days waiting for an air ambulance, all the time his toe infection worsening. All the time I had no antibiotics. And I kept, the nurses kept saying to me, you should be on antibiotics. And I'd say, where are they? Let's do it. And they say, well, we're only nurses, mate. We can't do that. Finally in Dubbo, another night passed before he was taken into theatre to have his toe cut off under a local anaesthetic. And I can hear them working. And all of a sudden, the tourniquet on the thigh tightened right up. And I thought, that's the signal. And it hurt. So how can all of what happened to you be explained? Well, it can't be explained. It's a total breakdown in the system. There's too many patients being pushed in here and there aren't enough staff to do the jobs. Somebody needs to get these people and give them a good shaking because it's more than my piffling thing with my toe. And I know I could have died, but I didn't. So I, I say, Mr Hazard, it's time to get out and face the music. There will always be a chance. It's just not that simple. No more excuses. You hand out billions of dollars. What's going wrong? How to make a sick system better. The key is coming together. The key is empowerment. But at what cost? I know about your dad. I know about so many other dads. It just doesn't go away. That's next on 60 Minutes. Seven million Australians, seven million Australians live in country, rural, remote areas, and their health system is compromised. Rural doctors will tell you they're begging for help, begging for something better. 
That's not fair. We've got a system that is really, really sick when it's beyond the major cities. I hate to say it, but a lot of times I think it's out of sight, out of mind. Ryan Park is New South Wales Shadow Minister for Health. He wants all sides of politics to join forces to once and for all fix rural health care. This is Australia in 2020. We should pride ourselves on having universal access to health care. And at the moment, a postcode is determining the level of access to health care you get, and that's simply not right. Because we have a rural health commissioner appointed by the federal government. We have health ministers in every state. We have any number of government organisations appointed to look at rural health. Nothing happens. No. Nothing has changed. Well, it's appalling and it's a reflection, on my view, from governments of all political persuasions probably over the last 20 or 30 years, Liz. If some of these stories were coming out of a major Sydney hospital, there'd be a riot in the street and there would be action within the day. An hour from my hometown of Taree is Port Macquarie, where the hospital and health services are a model for what rural health can be. And the key is coming together? The key is coming together. The key is empowerment. Um, if the local community is empowered to do it, it becomes easy for government. Rob Oakeshott is training to be a doctor here. But a few years back, the former politician and local member managed to bring together all interested parties, both private and public, to come up with a strong regional health care plan. The result is impressive and now includes a university campus where students can get a full medical degree. It might take a bit of money, a bit of support, but in the end, the grunt work is done by the community and then the worst thing government could do is slap it down at the end and say, no, not interested, we're going to do it our way. That's the complete opposite. That just disempowers and the whole thing falls apart. And, you know, we're in a very unhealthy state and that happens too often. I met with New South Wales Health Minister Brad Hazard to put to him what Jamel and I have discovered and what those working at the coalface of the rural health system have told us. You hand out billions of dollars. Mm. You surely must be saying, where is this money going for me to be hearing stories about, you know, someone having to travel four hours to get an antibiotic? We in New South Wales are spending around about just shy of 28 billion this year. So almost uh, it's more than 30 odd percent, but closer to 40 percent of the budget, so our entire is, state budget. So why are these stories health. happening? We have, we have a wall of silence, basically, uh, behind which medical professionals, nurses, doctors, are speaking out to say things aren't good enough. Um, I receive people who have concerns about issues. I mean, it's a, it's a massive system. Are you saying uh, this doesn't happen? I mean, I, I can tell you it's happening. I see it. It's, I, a massive, I... it's a massive system, Liz, and it is the biggest and best health system by far, probably in the world. Just li listening to you makes me frustrated, I have to say, and I don't work in the health system because I, I think I'm hearing politics. I don't think I'm no, hear you're hearing... I'm, you're hearing I'm, genuine concern that... The, the health system in New South Wales is a fantastic system. There are individual issues that arise, obviously, but when there's two million people, quarter of the New South Wales population come through our ED each year, um, there will be from time to time issues. They will always be a challenge. It's just not that simple. In essence, are you saying to me, you're happy? The rural health system is a success. What I'm saying is that this government, my government and me as health minister, have worked very hard to try and support... That's not my question. Are you happy? Is uh, this, are you, as the health minister, happy with rural health services as they stand? Well, you can ask your question and, of course, I can answer it and I'm answering it. Every health minister in the country has actually try, has tried very hard to support regional and rural hospitals. We have discussions amongst the, meeting, the meetings we have about how we can all do that Everybody is trying. I'll ask one more time. Are you happy with rural services in New South Wales? I am happy that we as a government are doing everything humanly possible to make sure that the health system in regional New South Wales is as good as it can humanly be.
Losing our fathers has been devastating, and finding out why has been a painful journey for Jamel and I. Dear father, I've got your photographs. Thank God for photographs. Hip, hip, hooray. But if we've found one overwhelming Dear answer, father, it's that we need to keep asking questions. And not just for our families, but for every other family living in rural Australia. You learn to accept that your father's gone. You learn to live with it somewhere in your heart and think, well, he's not physically here. But you can't just say, oh, it's all right. It's fine, I'll just, I'll just leave that there. It's, it's broken, there's things wrong, but I'll move on. Dear father, I feel your healing hand. That which happened to dad, we now know, I know about your dad, I know about so many other dads, and it just doesn't go away. I would have failed if I had not tried to tell this story. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.